Good morning and welcome. This is Karen Goldner with the Women's Business Development Center in Chicago. We are so excited today to welcome our special guest, MXO Tech, to talk about uh, cybersecurity. And I'm going to just uh, give a quick introduction and then turn it over to, um, to our friends from MXO Tech. I have Karen uh, Burmeister and Bart Barsowicz. Uh, Karen is a business development executive and Bart is the director of IT and senior infrastructure administrator from MXO Tech here today as your expert presenters. Founded in 2005, MXO Tech is a managed services application development provider that provides technology services to companies seeking outstanding 24-7 help desk support, cloud solutions, custom line of business applications, and network security. MXO helps its clients to put uh, critical security policies in place to protect their computer systems against cyber attacks, data law, data breach lawsuits and loss, compliance penalties, organizational disruption, and an employee downtime. Uh, MXO Tech is also one of our wonderful certified WBE women-owned businesses, and so we were so um, grateful that they uh, agreed to do this today. They have been recognized as one of the nation's fastest growing companies by Inc. Magazine and honored as one of the top ranked um, managed service uh, providers in the world, according to Penton Technologies. MSP 501 list and uh, their study. And you can see their website here, www.mxotech.com. And now I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Karen and Bart. Oh, and I should say this about questions. If you have questions, go ahead and type them in. And um, if the program doesn't cover them, we'll get to them at the end. So uh, you can just go ahead and type them in, and I'll be paying attention to that. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen and Bart. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting us here today. We are very excited uh, to present. Security is something that is a very popular topic nowadays. We always have people you know, asking us about the best ways to protect themselves. And so it's something that we really uh, enjoy talking about and educating others on. Just to give you a little bit more background on MXO Tech, clients come to us for a variety of reasons. Some have either outgrown their existing IT resource, and they want us to provide them with help desk support, security, cloud solutions, um, or they want you know, our help in uh, helping them to examine their current applications and create efficiencies with technology. We are located uh, right in the West Loop over on Adams and Aberdeen. All of our engineers sit here. Um, we've been in business for over 10 years now. And I'm excited to have Bart on the call. He is a certified security professional. He takes care of all the security here for ourselves at MXO Tech and all of our clients. So in other words, this is the guy who knows a heck of a lot about keeping your network safe. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bart, and he can give you a little bit more uh, information. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be with you today and teach you a little bit more about security. Um, just to give you a little bit more, more background on me, I've been doing security for over five years now, and I deal with security in all kinds of aspects, if it's infrastructure or policy policies or anything else that has to do with IT and business security, business continuity, and uh, all aspects of that. Uh, I, as Karen mentioned, I, I am a certified uh, security professional. Um, to give you some more background, I've been doing IT for about 10 years now and been concentrating on security a lot over the last five years. And I am the I am MXO's uh, uh, security officer as well as a uh, certified uh, HIPAA security officer as well. Okay, well, you know, today let's start off with a little review of the landscape and why cybercrime is making headline news. Um, you know, it seems like every day you're hearing about another business that was compromised. And it just seems that, you know, there's new and more complex types of threats and crimes that are being perpetrated against small and large sites companies. Yeah, so just uh, just to go over a little bit here, the, the cybercrime has really evolved over 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 the years. Uh, originally, it was very centralized. All the attackers had to act, had to actually put a lot of time into it and build all their attack mechanism and servers and everything else from scratch, which became very expensive for them. And that's why they were targeting 
very large customers and they were trying to get the best ROI for the money that they were actually putting in. Uh, versus today, the crime ecosystem is very, has evolved a lot and it's much more distributed. You can actually buy or just rent hosted servers. You can specialize in different areas. It becomes much cheaper, which is really starting to become a, bit, an, a higher and higher uh, risk and threat to the small and medium companies because the attackers are now looking for volume. They're now looking for those big return on investments that they previously would be looking for, but right now they're just going after value. So just to So what you're saying is that it's not just a few guys in a garage anymore, it's becoming a lot more sophisticated. Yeah, that's definitely what it's doing. That's definitely what's happening. It's becoming a lot bigger cyber rings and it's just becoming a lot easier versus having to host it from the garage. You can host it from any cloud provider now because they don't always check. You just rent the space as a virtual machine or a server, and they don't check what you run on there. And if you can hide it good enough, then they will never find it. Um, so as you can see here, the digital underground, it's, it's a very thriving market that's on a dark web. That's why um, the attackers are now fo focusing on, on smaller companies, because just the first two pages of a medical record are worth $50. So they don't have to go after huge practices anymore. They can go after smaller and smaller practices when it comes to uh, the patient edit, uh, information. Um, and then as we go down the list, you have, um, you have credit cards, item accounts, uh, physical credit cards as well, which people clone. So that's why now you see more and more commercials and, uh, and different things of people advertising uh, wallets that provide RFID protection so someone can just basically steal the credit card right from your pocket when they're standing next to you on the train. So that's, there are different things that you definitely have to look out for now as it's becoming more and more distributed. Uh, as we move on, with it being more and more distributed, there's actually advertisements. It's becoming a whole infrastructure around it with job postings, um, the black market money exchanges and different marketplaces of where people actually can sell infected computers uh, for profit and not really have to do the hacking work themselves. So there's actual job postings to become a cyber criminal? Yes, that is correct. So there's all kinds of different things that you can find in the dark web. Um, as you can see here, there, there are some statistics that have been studied on um, around different areas of uh, of cybersecurity. So according to the, the statistics we have on the screen, uh, they're from Small Business Trends and the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, you can see 55% of uh, surveyors uh, have experienced a cyber attack in the last few years. And then not only that, 50% um, um, actually reported that those attacks cost them nearly $900,000 in damages because it was either their employment information or the client information that was stolen. And then that comes with a lot of different reper repercussions. Uh, let's say somebody's um, ident social security numbers are stolen and then the company has to give out credit monitoring, credit protection, and sometimes they might even get sued if something else happens to it. And uh, just to make that worse, also for those companies, the recovery from the downtime of uh, being hacked or compromised it could cost nearly a million dollars. So that's definitely the big area of concern nowadays that we really want to uh, spread awareness about and make sure that everyone is protected from right now. Um, just to add some more shocking news to that, it's especially small businesses and some medium businesses, as you can see on here, 75% of them have no cybersecurity insurance policies. Um, those insurance policies are actually not as expensive as I know some people may think. So it's definitely a good thing to actually look out, look into it, and just make sure that you're protected because you don't want to be paying that money out of your own pocket in case something happens. Uh, Do most uh, insurance companies now offer this type of cybersecurity for businesses? Yeah, a lot of, I would say most, if not most, there's a vast majority. There's quite a few of them now that will offer regular business insurance and they'll also add cybersecurity insurance on top of your errors and emissions insurance that you normally have to have as a business to be protected anyway. Um, and then as we move down, 65% um, of, of respondents uh, say that they won't 
uh, budget more money for more money for cybersecurity this year, and some of those even are ones that have been hit. Um, I've been at a conference uh, last year, and we actually went to a, a cybersecurity panel, and it was a uh, it was a company that prepared taxes, and they were hit somewhere from Africa where somebody logged in and started stealing all kinds of information that they had, and then they started filing fake fake tax returns. So there was a lot of repercussions for that, and it also hurts your it also hurts your business. It hurts your reputation. You may lose clients. So there's there's a lot of potential laws there, and some people don't even learn from mis mistakes that they have because even after that, the one of the higher ups at the company still asks why do they have to have secure passwords. So I mean, that's one of the things that really should be eye opening. That everyone should be looking out for that, and everyone should really um, be doing that. And Another big thing is um, the backup of files. It's 22% that have not backed up important files, but the importance of backing up files, especially for a small business, is, is if you get hit with ransomware, it is a lot of times a hell of a lot cheaper uh, actually backing up your files than having to pay the ransom to get them back because that's never guaranteed that you actually get them back. All right, well, why don't we get into a part. What are some of the earliest stages of attacks, and how do people even get infected with malware to begin with? Um, so the question is, how do online thieves get personal information? Um, the number one risk for a company that comes to cybersecurity is actually employees, because employees are the ones that go out on the web, Go, go out on the web, receive emails, click on different links that we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit. And that's your, a lot of times that's the first point of attack for those cyber criminals. And we're gonna go over a few ways of how that could actually happen. Uh, so the number one way is email. Um, it, it's the easiest way for the attackers to spread viruses, to spread different links or phishing websites or anything else that, that you may encounter on that, and then they make they may offer a free gift, but then they ask you for a credit card to cover shipping and handling, or um, a lot of other things that could also come from that. So as you can see on the next slide, uh, there are emails that are really fine tuned for uh, the SMB market, and even for businesses, not just small businesses, but that also goes out to uh, to bigger businesses as well. Uh, as you can see on here, we have two emails. One is from FedEx and one is from AT&T, and even though those emails look very legit, those emails look very, I mean, they look like they would have came from the company. They have their logos, they have their colors, everything matches, but a few minor details. So, like, if you look at the FedEx email, um, right on top of it, it says FedEx service, where it's kind of like the from email, but if you look at the actual email address, it's not, fed, it's not at FedEx.com, it's at FedEx.com. So that's how the attackers will get you. So the big question to ask yourself here is, is it normal for a sender to send this type of request or a link or an attachment? Uh, is the message following the standard procedure that you've, know, that you've seen from the company before? Or is it a one-off? And sometimes if it's a one-off, you definitely want to investigate it a little bit more. Um, and then clicking with caution. So always make sure that before you click, you think twice about it. So the virus is mo most often coming from an attachment that you would open or from taking you to an internet site. It could be a site that's embedded into the email that you will click on and it will take you to the wrong site. So sometimes a good thing to do there is before you actually click an embedded link that's in an email, just hover over it. And when you hover over with your mouse, it would actually show you the website that it, that it is taking you to. So just verify that website. And if something is not right or you're not sure, just ask your IT person or ask the security professional that you may have on site. Or even if you want to spread it to your employees, just tell them, if you don't know, just ask me. So there's all kinds of different things that you could do to prevent that. Well, and Bar, isn't it becoming even more common for hackers to make fake emails between employees so to make it look like, for example, an email is coming from a CEO to a CFO? Yes, yes, definitely. So now with um, all the data being on the internet, with LinkedIn, with company web pages, 
and everyone's titles being up there. A lot of companies even put email addresses for their higher level executives right on their website. Uh, so with that, what the attackers are doing is they'll try to spoof an email address and send an email that looks like it's coming from a CEO of a company and it'll go to the CFO of the same company requesting a wire transfer. And it happened where the CFO would actually respond to, uh, to the email and think nothing of it, especially if it's something that happened on a regular basis, then they might not be as alert. Uh, but I can tell you it actually happened to us as well. It looks like it looked like there was an email that came from uh, Joanna, our CEO, and went into our went to our CFO, and he read it and he right away alerted us, asking what's going on and if that's actually something that should be happening. So just adding the extra step of not just doing wire transfers over email, maybe doing a phone call to verify, or even going a step further, we actually follow a process that has uh, more of a paper trail where you print them out and then submit them in. So there's different ways uh, mm -hmm. to protect yourself from that. That's scary. Yeah, it definitely is becoming more and more scary and it is happening to small companies, it is happening to big companies, it has happened to multiple of our clients where we've seen this. Uh, there's ways to prevent it and we have taken those steps as well. So if you are a client or become our client, we can definitely help you out with that as well. Uh, another big one is, uh, is phishing. So the way the phishing works is someone could go to a website and uh, it could either be a pop-up message or a spam email that came through and you click on the link and it, let's say it will take you to a website for Facebook or Chase Bank. And it looks just like Chase Bank, but the actual website name is misspelled. It could be Chase with two E's or two S's or two A's, two S's and two E's. There's all kinds of different variations and what the attackers will look for is the attackers will look for the domains that have not been purchased and are available and try to go that route. And then you try to log into your bank and you put in your username and password, you get a pop-up saying you have to change it or it's not valid or something else or the website just shuts off. And then right there and then they actually have your password. So that's that, that's an important thing to make sure that you're, you're protected from there. So maybe um, adding an extra step to authentication for different sites, making them multi-factor, you'll definitely be a lot more protected. Um, and then another big one that has been um, that has been rising and rising it's uh, it's malvertising. So we talked before um, about how credit cards get stolen and their credit cards are sold in the black market. So those cyber criminals they will use those stolen or fake credit cards to actually set up a website with different exploit kits, or they'll put fake ads up on what on the, on the actual on the actual real sites like New York Times or any other sites that you could think of that a lot of people will go to. So it's, um, and then what happens is users can download a program that is, that's in the ad. It's a free program that will allow you to do mass emailing or it will help you with lead generation or all kinds of other things. And then from there, when the software gets installed, that's how, that's how, you, that's how the users get, get affected. Uh, and here's a, a little uh, uh, example of how the ads actually look like. As you can see on the website, the website is it's a real site with real articles, but there could be an advertisement that looks very real, and as soon as you click on it, there might be a catch, and you go through it and fill it out, or you have to download something, and then, and then you get um, compromised. So that looks like a real ad. So you're, what you're saying is a criminal will purchase and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll use we'll use they'll use stolen credit cards okay. to purchase a real, real ads ad. on real sites, and that's how they spread more malware and more more uh, more viruses. So as a visitor on that website, how would you know that not to click on that link or how to go there? A lot of times, if it's too good to be true, I would definitely think twice about it before clicking the link or going forward with it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about spyware. So let's say the ways that we just talked about, if your system does become compromised in, uh, in one of the ways that we mentioned, um, oftentimes the most popular uh, type of viruses, uh, it's spyware and then ransomware, which we're going to talk about, which we'll talk about a little later, 
but spyware is the it's the risky one now because it could actually monitor what you do on your computer it can control your computer and it could actually get your uh, information your logins your credit cards and things like that um, so we're mentioning spyware there has been an explosion of it so especially in this Eastern Europe uh, as you can see up here which is two hundred dollars in your pocket uh, and a little incentive to actually make, make some money uh, the startup costs for a cyber criminal are a lot of times less than if they were op if they were to open a coffee stand so it's definitely something that that is spreading and we hear more about it in the news and there's different exploits and different attacks and it just keeps going on and on and the reality of it is which is a sad reality it's only going to get worse so that's why the protections have to get better and you have to add a lot more steps and a lot more layers to your security to be better protected. Can you walk us through how the malware spreads? So as we talk about um, different ways of being infected, so the increasingly uh, common step, and that's for ransomware or spyware, those would be the two big ones that do use it, is the attackers will just install something on a computer that's called a dropper. So it's, um, they'll just install the software and then the next step of that is it'll actually just sit there quietly, it'll phone home, it'll say, it will just transmit all kinds of information about the computer that it's on, about its serial number, about maybe some product keys that it uses, what kind of antivirus does it use, does it use. so then the attackers could actually prepare different attacks for different types of virus software, look for, look for exploits in certain versions or builds uh, of the software. And then also, it also looks for, as it sits there and collects more information, it actually looks for, has have the virus definitions been updated recently? Is there something that, maybe something else that it could actually find? So, and at this point, too, at, at step two, we may not even know that our computer or our network is infected. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of times you will not know that. And sometimes uh, those are those could even be not so easily detected by the antivirus software. So that's why the antivirus software is becoming more and more strict on what it what it allows, which in the end could even cause productivity loss just by having antivirus software. But different policies and different risks. So that's why it's sometimes it could be cumbersome actually even using an antivirus. But there are different ones that do it quick and. They can, you actually don't feel as much of an impact. So as those bad actors actually spread more and more of those droppers or hooks into the system, uh, they have the ability of either selling them or renting them. And then from there, um, they actually set up contracts and they could install different types of payloads like ransomware, key loggers, spam bots, and then they'll, they'll lease them. So they'll give somebody you rent saying, okay, you get that for, let's say, three months, and then after that, they take it off, and they could reuse the same computers if they were not cleaned and some somebody else. So that's why it's becoming more and more, um, I guess, more and more scary the way, if you look at it that way. So the people that, the criminals that are installing the malware aren't always the ones that are actually doing the, the, the you know, perpetrating you that they're they're selling those accounts then yeah to other yeah. criminals a lot of times they actually sell them and uh, as you can see on here um, there's the dark web and there's different things that that people sell so you can um, one of the the cyber criminals uh, what they actually did is they installed a lot of those different agents uh, and hooks into the system and just because they have too many they're going on and now they're going to be selling them so They'll sell them, they'll put the payload on there so it could be a grabber or a spam bot and different things what they can do and you can get started in less than 10 minutes. So there's um, there's the whole infrastructure around it now and unfortunately it's growing more and more. So this person is trying to sell their uh, their installs. Yeah, they're trying to sell their overstock, overstock and stuff that they had nothing to do with anymore. Hmm. So what types of malware are out there, Bart, and how exactly do they work? 
All right, so let's go over SpyEye. So we did talk about spyware already. So SpyEye is one of those um, spyware types that um, that's actually a keylogger. So what that one will do is if it is installed in the system and the attacker has access to it, they can select different things that they want to look for. If they want to look for um, credit card grabbers, like that's the one that's up on the screen, it will look the key logger will look for patterns of characters and keys and keystrokes that will look like that will, uh, reference credit cards, even addresses that come with the credit cards. Uh, and you can also select if you want the security codes only or address only, but that's how it's going to go. And see, a couple other types that you can see on here, it's, it's like a control panel for the cyber criminal where they can actually select the guy on A, B, and C, and they'll get the credit cards the Bank of America login grabbers, and let's say email grabbers, so email passwords or different emails that are being sent out. It's like a dashboard or a portal for criminals. Yeah, and for, that's that's what's been happening. It's, it's becoming more and more, like we mentioned before, sophisticated, and it's just easier for those cyber criminals to actually infect and go with it. Uh, as you can see here, the the Russian uh, spy eye out there. He actually pled uh, guilty to the charges that he had. We put it up on the screen. Um, according to the charges, uh, he um, he sold custom versions of spy eye to invitation only uh, forms that range anywhere from a thousand dollars to eighty five hundred dollars a piece. And with having one hundred fifty clients, he made a lot of money. But then the problem with that is even though he got caught, the other attackers that actually went out and used it and stole lots and lots of money and compromised and could have ruined businesses and lives, they were not caught, but that's something that is at least a good thing is that authorities are actually cracking down on cyber criminals and they are doing it more and more because it's spreading a lot more now. And then to talk a little bit about uh, ransomware, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, you guys that are on the call today um, heard about ransomware. There could be different types of it. It could be a fake antivirus, it could be an FBI ransomware, and then there's different types of cryptovirus. Uh, we just list a few up there. It's probably a fraction of the different names that they actually go by right now. Um, but it could, it could range for different things. It could sit there quiet, quietly, it could be installed, and then one day it just goes off and starts encrypting your files and then if you don't have a backup then unfortunately you do have to uh, you do have to pay the ransom um, and just spreading awareness of that is it's a good thing and uh, knowing how to be protected and backing up all of your data and making sure you can be you, you have the business continuity plan in place that if this does happen you don't lose productivity, you don't lose money, and you also don't lose clients. So this crypto locker is an example of where a criminal could get in and say, you have to give me you know, X amount of money or Bitcoin by this amount of time or we're taking your data, yes, your files? Basically what happens is the files get encrypted. So they, they don't take the data. They don't really care about the data at all. They'll encrypt it, and they will keep the private key for the encryption. So without that key, the files cannot, cannot be decrypted. So what they're threatening is they will destroy the public key so then the files are non-recoverable beyond that point. And with CryptoLocker, I mean, it could range from, the one that we have up on the screen was a $100 one, which is, which is fairly low nowadays. I mean, I've heard of cases, even from friends in the industry, that if it's a bigger company, that gets hit by crypto locker and it's actually targeted, those numbers could go into thousands, into tens of thousands of dollars, especially if they know that sometimes they will pay just to get the data back. And now what the government is also trying to do is, um, not the government, the HIPAA and the HHS, uh, they're going to start looking at crypto locker as an actual uh, breach, which this did not happen in the past, but now they're, they're talking about um, adding that to it. So this is a question that, you know, I'm sure everyone on the webinar is curious about and wanting to hear. 
I think most organization owners trust that their banks are going to protect them against online crime. Is that the case, Bart? It is the case for personal accounts, but it is not a case for business accounts. So as you can see up, up here, FDIC does not protect uh, you as a business uh, from bank fraud. And the bank is not responsible for, for getting your money back for getting your money back. So that's why when we talked earlier about the different wire transfers or different other things that happen, it is very important to actually have this in here. Have keep that in mind as you're not as protected as you would be if it was just your personal account. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see here there were all kinds of different uh, small and medium businesses, uh, bank breaches, um, an $81,000 breach at a movie theater is not going to make the evening news, but those breaches could be devastating to the, to the little companies. And then one thing that it does not mention is what about all the downtime and the data tap that could also come with it. Um, a lot of times this a lot of times the stolen money could cause other things. It could cause downtime. It could cause uh, a delay in paying bills or paying payroll or other things that a business is obligated to do to keep operating. Uh, so the big thing here is how do, how can small and medium businesses protect themselves from that fraud? So we talk a lot about having a dedicated um, computer for banking. Uh, making sure you set up multi-factor authentication for your online banking. Uh, a so lot what of you're talking about about having a phone call or something in writing if you get a request for a wire transfer, for example. Yeah, so like that would be for for the wire transfers. But even like when logging into your online banking, even though you're using a dedicated computer, but then you have either a little fob that could have numbers on it, or you could have an app on your phone that will give you a set of characters or something that you have to click approve on after you put in your username and password just to add that extra factor uh, to make sure that you're, you're protected. And then you have to be very careful with your debit cards for your business accounts. Um, they're the number one way the bank account could get compromised. So a lot of businesses choose actually not to have debit cards at all because it could get lost, could get stolen, anything can happen with it. And then sign up for email alerts from your bank uh, whenever there's a, a withdrawal that's over $100. Uh, you can require your signature or email release for wire transfers, like Karen mentioned, just making sure that that does happen so you are better protected. And some banks will actually call you. So like, if you want to set it up that they have to call you, you have a dedicated number they have to call you at. And if you don't pick up, then the wire transfer doesn't happen or get canceled. Um, you can have your money spread out in multiple accounts to min minimize the risk. And then also set up uh, positive pays to make sure that um, when you write checks, you send all the checks that you write to the bank, and a lot of banks will do it now. And the banks only, the bank will only clear the checks that you actually send them. That's how positive pay actually works. So what is the biggest threat to you know, a small or medium-sized organization security? So the biggest threat is that the attackers will actually target the weakest link that's in the supply chain. Um, so as you can see here, uh, there's a network of stores and they can get smaller. They could go from headquarters into branch offices into off networks and different suppliers. <coughs> Excuse me. So what the attackers will actually target is they'll go into the off network and suppliers and then keep going layer and layer and deeper to try to get to the data. Um, so I'm sure everyone has heard about the target breach that happened uh, a couple years ago now. So the way that that came along is it was not target that was directly infected. Um, it was the target contract, the target HVAC contractor um, called uh, Fazio Mechanical Services where they monitored their fridges and freezers and they had a connection into Target as a, at a specific layer, and they were infected. Uh, they were using a free version um, of Malwarebytes, which is a malware prevention software, as their security layer, which is not, which is way lower than what a business should actually have. So you definitely want to make 
they should have been protected a lot better and then the attackers went into them from there they got a target and then everything that would target happened which happened right before Christmas I know it definitely uh, made Christmas harder for a lot of people with all the credit cards being closed and canceled and people not being able to make purchases so target what wasn't actually the one hacked it was the, the smaller supplier or vendor that they were using that got attacked and from there they were able to gain access yeah. to target uh, so they targeted the, the weakest link that they could possibly find and it was from my point of view, it was definitely a targeted attack. So they mm -hmm. knew who they had to target, but they were able to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, right. So while it was a hiccup for uh, for Target, uh, for a small business, the impact of a breach could be could be much higher. Um, according to the National Security National Cybersecurity Alliance. 60% uh, of small firms uh, go out of business within six months of a data breach, which that's something that is it's very devastating and definitely something you want to be protected from. So how can we protect and contain all these different threats you've been talking about today, Bart? Right. So we have it up on the, on the screen. So back in the day, the protection against cybersecurity was, I have an antivirus, I'm protected. Right now, the approach of having a single layer of protection, if it's an antivirus or an anti-malware or firewall, it's not enough. So you, nothing is 100% bulletproof. So that's why you have to make sure that you have a multi-layered approach to security. Um, so starting at the very edge of your network or of your office, having a state-of-the-art firewall with unified threat management, which would help with intrusion prevention and gateway antivirus and other things that it will have, it will have in it. So not just purchasing a home-grade firewall from Best Buy that does not have those services because that basically just gives you a connection to the internet and does not give you the extra layer of protection that, that you should have. Um, having a centrally managed antivirus and anti-malware software, making sure you can control your policies and everything from one place, making sure that um, agents and computers are constantly updated with brand new definitions of viruses and malware and, and whatnot. Uh, having email filtering, um, so having a third-party reputable service for that, so that also adds an extra layer of protection, making sure what the email filtering will do for you, it, it has really grown over over the years. Before it was only, you will just look for inbound and outbound spam that could be coming in or being sent out from the organization and viruses. Right now, you can add a lot more features to it, like data loss prevention. You can set up different rules for emails that are going out. Um, let's say if there's personal, personal personally identifiable informa information in an email, you can have a rule set up where email gets sent and the information is in there, it either gets bounced back or it gets bounced back and the manager gets notified or an IT professional gets notified or if that's something that you do on a regular basis, then the message could be out of encrypted when it goes out to the recipient. So it's not traveling over the internet in clear text where it could actually be easily uh, intercepted. Um, so content filtering, controlling the websites that your employees are accessing and the time that they're spending on there, uh, implementing a mobile device policy and security protocols. That's mainly for BYOD environments, but nowadays even if someone does get a laptop from a company where they have all their data, they still want to have the email on their phone and they don't want a company phone. They want to have one phone, not carry around two or three, two or three devices with them wherever they go so they can have access to to all those. Um, uh, forcing passwords that are difficult to hack. So that's another layer is making sure that uh, you have passwords that do involve complexity that cannot be first name, last name of the employee or the word password or a dictionary word. And you set minimum length for those passwords and you change them on a regular basis. It could be every three months, four months, six months, 
at a minimum once a year, but we do recommend going every uh, six months actually at the minimum. And then uh, in our organization, with me being the security officer, we actually do change them every 60 days, which not everyone is super happy about, but we want to make sure that we, we're protected and we're not uh, prone to different infections or password hacks. Um, using a solid backup solution for your systems, so making sure your systems are backed up, backups are verified, backups are stored off-site. Um, just in case, let's say, if the attacker gets in and they somehow get, gain control of your system and they kill your backup server that you have on-site, so having that extra copy off-site in the cloud with a service provider that you can restore from is definitely a, a very good route to take. And I know some of you may ask why are backups important for security is Security really compromises of, um, of three things when it comes to data, and it's confidentiality of data, integrity of data, and availability of data. So backup does is one of them. So it could be integrity or availability. So even make checking if the files were changed or making sure that they weren't changed or having to restore from them. Um, and then I should have probably put that on top, as we did mention before that your employees are your number one risk. So really making sure that there is employee education and cybersecurity awareness training and you have the employees do it either when they start or you can even have them do it yearly. There's different platforms out there and I'll let, I'll let Karen talk about that um, where your employees can get trained and even get a, cert get a certificate every year that they went through the course and they passed and they took an exam and passed it with a, with a passing score. So. so yeah, so you know, as evident from from all the information that, that Bart shared today, having secure backups and antivirus and anti malware is extremely important to the safety of your business. Cyber criminals are inventing new and more complex threats every day. You'd actually be shocked to learn how many clients when we first started working with them came to us and as we looked at their network found that they did have some sort of anti-malware or antivirus already installed. So, you know, even though they already had a, had antivirus in place and a, and a firewall, there's really nothing that you can do to be 100% protected as Bart mentioned. So having a multi-layered approach to security and having secure backups in place will greatly decrease your chances of becoming a victim. So we wanted to offer you something today. What's one thing that you could do to get started to help you protect yourself? And so what we wanted to offer to you is something that, that we recently launched called the MXO Umbrella Secure. It's actually the first security platform that's housed in the cloud. So it's built into the foundation of the internet and it, it helps to um, protect you by adding uh, an additional layer of, of security and blocking the request to malicious or unwanted websites before a request uh, or a connection is even established. And, you know, it will help to reduce your malware infections by 98%. If something would happen and you would get infected, it can help identify those threats even quicker and reduce the remediation time by 20%. And I think even more importantly, if not most important, it'll protect you both on and off your company network. So one of the things that we didn't talk a whole lot about today is the increased number of employees that are working remotely and that are working from home. And that poses an additional threat because if you're not working off your company's network, you're not protected against your company's firewall. And so one thing that this Umbrella Secure Service does, as I mentioned, it protects you from the cloud. So if something would happen and, you know, your company or employee is working off-site, they would still be protected against these different threats. So if you're a current MXO client, we include this at no additional charge of service because we think it's so important. But we wanted to go ahead and offer it to uh, everyone else that isn't a client. The only requirement is that you have at least 20 computers in order to, to sign up for the service. We want to, you know, waive the uh, setup fee for you, which is normally $300, and reduce the cost from $5 a month per user to $4 per month per user. Um, another thing that we offer to all of our clients and we would give to you again today is the employee security training. As Bart mentioned, employees are the number one threat to your business, not because people are careless or because they're malicious, but most people just don't understand 
and don't know the threats to look out for. They're not sure you know, what they should or shouldn't click on. And so by educating your employees, that's again adding that additional layer of protection against your business. So if you're interested in any of this or you have more questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. Um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions. We saw a few that were coming in, and I know we have a few more minutes left. Um, so if you want to go ahead, I can turn it back over to um, the WBDC, who can maybe help go through some of those questions that came in. Sure. Thank you very much, um, and thanks for that very nice offer. Uh, this is Karen Goldner, the WBDC again, and I'm going to um, go through some of the questions that, um, that people have asked, and also I have a couple. Um, so let me start out with a question from Sarah, who says, my company uses Wi-Fi. How do you determine if anyone outside of your company has hacked into or has access to your network while on Wi-Fi? So that there are different ways to do it. Wi-Fi is becoming a lot more and more, um, what do you say, compromisable. Um, easily cut more yeah, easily compromised. Easily compromisable. So it depends what kind of security the Wi-Fi uses. So there's a variety of different protocols that the wireless security could actually be set up as. So like let let's say if there's just one Wi-Fi and it's one password for everyone at the company that password should probably be periodically changed just to make sure that, um, that the attackers did not get the password and not, let's say, set up what's called an evil twin, which could be the wireless that has the same exact name and the same exact password, and those they can start blocking the other one by jamming it, and your laptops and smartphones and other things will connect to that Wi-Fi, and then they can easily steal, steal their data from there. So making sure if you're using just a single um, single password is making sure the password is used, uses the highest encryption and security standards. It is a complex password. And then what we recently started uh, actually switching our clients over to is a lot of the companies actually have Active Directory servers in-house where everybody has their own username and password. So then making sure that uh, a lot of the new wireless access points can actually be set up to authenticate against your server with the same username and password that you use to log into your computer. So then everyone has a different password. So as employees could be terminated or employees leave, they're not maliciously just going to give someone your Wi-Fi code because they were using their own username and password and they don't know what the other ones are. So that would be that there are some ways to uh, to get protected against that as well. Thank you. Is there a way um, to know whether someone has hacked into the Wi-Fi? Are there any symptoms or anything that you could, uh, that just a normal person could figure out? Um, so going to the symptoms, so like let's say if it is, the biggest hack on Wi-Fi will be the evil twin. So let's say if you're connecting and you can only get to the internet but not into your local network when you're connected to Wi-Fi, that could be one of the signs to look out for because the evil twin would not be connected into your internal network and would not have access to the local resources. So that would be the number one um, thing to look out for uh, to try to figure that out. Uh, there are other ways like network-wide intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems. Uh, some of them are built into next generation firewalls and some of them could actually be purchased and set up separately as well. Thank you. So I have a couple questions about backups, and I'm going to ask both of them because they, they may be related. Um, I don't know enough to know if they are related. So one question is, when doing backups, um, wouldn't that just basically back up the virus too, so the criminals would still have access when online? And the, the other question is, what about when you're talking about backing up, uh, what about if, if people back up onto, like, you know, Google Cloud or the Microsoft, I mean, there's a number of different cloud services um, that are fairly common. And I had been, I heard somewhere that sometimes this ransomware can even get into that, but I'd like to ask you about uh, those two things. So the first question is, um, wouldn't doing backups simply back up the virus once you're infected? And then second of all, do, does, do these things that you're talking about also have the same application for cloud-based systems? Yeah, so 
the end uh, it would actually be two two separate answers. So let me let me go over the backing up the virus first. So the big thing about backups is making sure that you do have multiple backups. So making sure the retention policy is set up in a way that you do have daily backups for let's say the last 14 days. So yes, if a computer or a server gets infected with a virus and you don't figure it out for like a day or two, then for a day or two, yes, it, it will definitely back up the virus. But that's why you have to have multiple restore points that you can go back to and reference when you're restoring data. And the big thing in, in there is actually trying to narrow down and pinpoint when the um, infection actually happened so you can go back and, and do that. And then uh, with the ransomware spreading into the cloud-hosted systems, uh, we've seen that happen before. We've seen different viruses spread into a Dropbox or a Google Cloud Drive or any other cloud systems. Uh, the good thing with those is making sure that if you are using them, that they do provide you the ability to restore previous versions of files. So you could go in and restore, but then it's the same thing, having to narrow down when the attack actually happened and then restoring the files back to that version. Uh, if it's single files or if it's restoring all of the files, there's different ways you can do that. But um, to answer the question, the virus would spread, and it could spread, like let's say if it's a Dropbox folder that's shared with multiple computers, it could keep spreading. But making sure that there's extra anti an antivirus and anti malware and different um, layers of protection that could happen and making sure that you're using the cloud file provider that actually gives you the ability to restore uh, previous versions of files so you can remediate that. Thanks, Bart. Um, those are all the questions I have so far. I, I wanted to make a couple quick comments. And if anybody else who's on the call right now, if you're watching this live, which right now you're watching it live, um, go ahead and send in your questions. But um, one thing I wanted to, to make sure to point out to people is um, cybersecurity insurance coverage which you discussed at the very beginning, to make sure that um, people understand that it is not a part of the normal commercial package. It's an add-on. Um, and as you pointed out, Bart, it's generally not very expensive. But don't think just because you have kind of your normal commercial insurance package, you know, the sort of slip and fall kinds of stuff, that cybersecurity coverage is not in that package unless you have explicitly added it. Um, the other thing that um, I think that your the story about Target and their uh, HVAC co contractor uh, that is so instructive is we've seen uh, one of the biggest trends in corporate procurement um, over the last really even year or, or so. It's pretty current. Um, that, that large corporations require a very high level of network security from their suppliers. Um, so if you are looking to try to get a contract with for instance, a Target <laughs> um, or any uh, any large corporation like that, you're typically going, you know, to have in the in your agreement with them uh, a lot of requirements that they're going to put out for you uh, in, in terms of network security to, to address this very um, this very important issue. So just kind of be aware of that and make sure that you are able to comply with those uh, requirements. Um, and if you need to talk with the um, you know, your, the, the procurement, the buyer, um, to make sure you fully understand them, uh, because it really is, um, it really is a big, uh, a big issue. So I am not seeing any other questions. Um, so I also then just want to end by saying that this program is going to be archived on our website. So if you go to wbdc.org and into the events and training tab, um, then you'll see our e-learning library and um, probably by later this afternoon it'll be up. You can watch it um, whenever you want. Uh, you can share it with others um, in your organization or, or other people you know um, because this has been um, really, really um, helpful. Um, Wendy, I see you have your hand up. I don't have access to get to you unless you type in your question. So uh, I'm going to give Wendy another couple minutes to type her question. Um, and uh, then just ask Karen and Bart if you have any last comments.
So Karen and Bart, if you've muted yourself, um, unmute yourself, please. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the question. What if you have multiple antivirus software, do they compete against each other to protect your system? So if you're doing, Bart, what you had said, which is use multiple things, do they cancel each other out or compete against each other? So they could complement each other or they could at times conflict with each other. So definitely making sure that if you're pairing different solutions, that you're pairing them right and you research them and make sure that they do actually work uh, side by side. So a lot, of, a lot of what we offer is we actually offer an antivirus software, which will look for viruses and different exploits. And then we'll also offer an anti-malware software that's going to look for malware. So there's the two solutions right there. And then we'll add different gateway antivirus that could be on the firewall. So if you're going out to the internet or you download files or upload files, those are also scanned for different viruses. Okay, thanks. You know, the one of the, the, the thing that, you know, seems like it could be just overwhelming here is, you know, it's, it's like this whole scary world and, and um, in a way it just kind of makes you want to turn off your computer and hide in your, your living room. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, I guess I would encourage people to think about this as just a, you know, a basic level of behavior, right? You're not, you would not leave your office door unlocked at night, typically, not in uh, most places. You have windows um, rather, you know, that are made of something solid rather than just something that people can crawl through physically. Um, you have a limited number of people who have access uh, with your keys to get into your physical building. Um, you know, so these are just things that we all do as a matter of course. And, you know, at one point in society that probably wasn't common. Um, so you just have to look at it as it's, you know, just something that you get used to doing. And because um, there are people out there who are using their, you know, cleverness for evil and, and not for good. Um, I want to close up by really thanking um, Alicia. Um, Plumman Spittler, who was the MXO Tech person who made this all happen, and of course Karen and Bart um, for their um, great words today. And uh, if you have questions, um, Karen has actually um, said that she is um, open to responding to some general questions. Um, if you send her an email, and her email address is, is currently showing on the screen, um, or if you are interested in learning more information and want to follow up with a WBBC advisor, um, we are available to help as well. We are certainly not IT uh, experts, but we can help get you pointed in the right direction. So I want to thank everybody um, for their time today and uh, encourage you. All oh, one last question. Is it possible to get the PowerPoint for this webinar or to be able to rewatch it? Uh, Susan, yes, it is um, going to be accessed on our or available on our website as I said, sometime later this afternoon. And it'll basically just be a giant uh, YouTube video. So you can go into the events and training part of our website and the e-learning library. Uh, and it will be an archived webinar. You just click on it, and it'll play again for you. So thank you all so very much, and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you definitely for having us. It was great speaking to you guys today.